Welcome back to lecture six in week seven of ethics and corporate social responsibility in which we're looking at moral issues in international business and globalization. This is objective two when we're going to look at specifically moral issues relevant to globalization and its impacts on power distribution around the world. You'll remember that I said, well, there's a lot of things that overlap. And just at the end of the last section, I said, well, even though we're going to go on and look at objective two next and look at democracy, equality, homogenization of world culture and distributive justice, that some of the things that I'd raised about the relationship between the WTO or between supranational organizations and multinational organizations, companies, and national governments also reflected a change in impact on power distribution around the world. So this is where the two things sort of blend into each other with objective one and objective two in particular overlapping. And similarly, we're going to talk a bit later about objective three and objective four, and they also overlap to some extent as well when we're talking about MNCs specifically, multinational corporations specifically. So the first issue that I want to raise, which builds on our discussion of the WTO, which builds on our discussion on supranational organisations, is that democracy is not necessarily part of international trade. The institutions that are governing international trade are supranational organisations, the WTO, for example, or they're a group of agreements between nations, such as the European Union, such as the ASEAN, and then after the Asia Free Trade Area, and we could name lots of those type of agreements, or they are bilateral agreements, for example, the Singapore-Australia um, Free Trade Agreement, the Thailand-Australia Free Tra Trade Agreement. And these aspects, these regulating bodies, are not necessarily democratic. And in fact, frequently they include countries that are either not democratic or only have a form of demi-democracy. And demi-democracy is in... There's two types of demi-democracy. We have traditional democracy which is representative democracy, which is practiced in many forms, predominantly in Western countries. We also have, a, not only in Western countries, but predominantly in Western countries. We then have a um, set of countries that have the trappings of democ democracies. They claim to be democracies, but in reality, they're not complete democracies. Um, Singapore is a democracy, however, it is extremely unlikely that an opposition party will ever become the dominant, um, be elected um, and become the ruling party because of the way the laws work, the way the libel laws work, the history of the country, and it basically has a single party rule with a small dis dissenting um, uh, um, opposition. Um, in Thailand, even though it has all the trappings of democracy and it has elections and representatives, there's a lot of corruption that has historically been involved. But in reality, since the coup in the 1930s that turned it from an absolute mo monarchy to a democratic uh, mo monarchy, a limited mo monarchy, um, uh, the, what's happened is there's been more coups, military coups, then there have been democratically elected governments. And there's been more unelected prime ministers, even in democratically elected governments, than elected prime ministers. So we've had this whole period of time, including now, where there is um, the trappings of democracy, a balance between business, the public service, the military, and democratically elected parliament, which is not complete. If we look at the way that both China and Vietnam have modernised their societies, it's not clear that either of those have modernised their societies as, as they've grown economically to become more democratic. 
Now, there are lots of arguments about the nature of representative democracy and whether all people should be involved in representative democracy and whether you can, in fact, have representative democracy within a system that is predominantly ruled by one party because maybe the party is, in fact, becomes what uh, uh, is the government and there are influences of the nature of the behaviour of the party. So it is a form of, of democracy, but traditionally that would not be described in that way. So, but even if all the parties of an agreement are democratic, and they're clearly not, um, uh, the actual processes themselves are arguably not de democratic. Further, when you have a power differential, particularly in relationship to um, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, we had the Asia financial crisis in the 90s, followed by the global financial crisis now, and what could, in fact, be occurring, uh, the global financial crisis about in, the, um, in 2008 and what is now occurring. In the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which occupy different floors on the same building, um, actually have a lot of power to influence government policy because they are in national governments, because they're the, com the countries, they're the organisation that is lending off money to government, that is facilitating the foregoing of debt by governments in developing countries. So there's a power differential there. There's also a power differential even within um, the World Trade Organization between large countries and small countries, politically powerful large countries and smaller countries. And beyond the World Trade Organization, you could see those things that occur in bilateral agreements between America and other countries, particularly in the area of intellectual property, for example. America changed the nature of intellectual property per, per protection to being 95 years after a corporate or after an author died. While normal intellectual properties only and the patents and trademarks are only twenty or thirty years, depending on whether they're pharmaceuticals or not, um, that's known as the Mickey Mouse Amendment to protect Mickey Mouse for another twenty-five years over the already extensive copyright protection that authors have for seventy years after their death for personal authors. Is uh, sorry, fifty years after your death for personal authors, seventy years after your death for corporate authors. It's now seventy and ninety. So you write a song in 1964 and not only are you uh, earning income from that song from then on, or you create a movie in 64 and not only are you um, earning uh, income from that so that movie in 1964, but you continue to earn income until you die and then after your death, you dead, your family continues to earn income from it. We could talk about intellectual property a lot. So... Many of the things that are called structural adjustments, which the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, um, apply to enable com countries to lend, borrow money. Many of the agreements you have in uh, bilateral agreements or within the broader WTO influence a government's discretionary power to implement policies of its own formulation. So that folds back into our discussion on supranational organisations. On balance, that is an issue. But I do not believe, personally, that multinational corporations are now the dominant force in, um, in that environment. And you can see that multinational corporations, even without these supranational organisations, can still have political power by choosing where to in invest. There are restrictions placed on developing nations as a condition of their membership of the WTO that disadvantage them. Some of those restrictions specifically relate to agriculture. Um, it also relates to intellectual property protection, uh, specifically about pharmaceutical, uh, but other areas of intellectual property. And such restrictions are not necessarily imposed by more powerful nations but may provide protective barriers for those nations. Now that draws from in most countries, particularly developed countries, that the farm lobby, the agricultural lobby has great power or greater power than the size of of its actual um, democratic vote um, because of quirks in the way democracy works in um, 
Western countries. Or not only Western countries, in developed countries. So in Australia, the National Party, which used to be called the Country Party, gets 15%-ish or less of the vote and ends up getting um, about 20 um, about 15% of the seats, a little bit more than 15% of the seats in the lower house of Parliament. The Greens get about 15% of the vote and they get no, or one or two seats. They used to get none. They're overrepresented because of the way the, the, the electorate works and the concentration of where people are. In the Senate in Australia, smaller states... Um, Tasmania get 10 senators, 12 senators, sorry. Largest states get the same number of senators. The ACT has more people than Tasmania and only gets two senators. So there's a bias towards particular political groups and the, the, Tasmania is largely a lobbying uh, sorry, agricultural uh, environment. So they have a lot of influence. Um, but the farm lobby also has great influence in the US um, and through organisation and factory farms, their farm agri agribusiness has great inf influence. Agribusiness has a great influence in Japan but, um, for cultural reasons, the protection of small farmers and also the, um, the romanticisation of the rural economy over the um, urban eco economy or the city-based economy also influences their power in the way that culture is used by governments um, to get elected or to maintain elections. How can I well, think about Australia? Australia is the most urbanised country in the world. That's not an island country. I know we're an island, but compared you know, a nation state like Singapore, is more urbanised because it's a tiny state with 5 million people in it. But for, for just countries that aren't those sort of compressed city-states, um, Australia has always had about 85% of people living in cities on the coastal fringes. But people lionise the rural background, um, the man from Snowy River that's been the backbone of... Australian society, the pioneers in Australia. And they do the same thing in the US. Even though predominantly, even though the US expanded across the country, it was particularly city-based and still is on the coast. Again, they have the same imbalance in their electoral system, particularly related to the Senate, which gives two senators to every state. Um, some senators have more. Some states have more senators than they do have House of Representatives, lower house seats, congressional seats. So, um, New York and uh, California have the same representation as Kentucky. So that inequality exists within nation states, and it is just an extension that it exists within uh, between nation states through issues like the World Trade Organization, which creates that power to put up particularly agricultural barriers and agricultural barriers um, are where, or the need for governments to put up agricultural barriers and agricultural barriers are where developing countries may have the best opportunity to initially develop. We see also a homogenization of world culture, that Western culture is reducing difference in capacity of other cultures to maintain their values. Sometimes that's called Americanization, sometimes it's called Anglification. Um, and, there, and even if we look at education, we see an undue focus in research and rewards for, you, for research for academics based on publication in what are predominantly American or European journals, American or British journals. English language journals get overrated compared with domestic, uh, with um, non-English language journals. And there's also a significant question about whether the cultural issues that America faces are the same as the cultural issues that the rest of the world faces. And if we look at the current COVID 
pandemic, whether or not America is in fact the leading font of knowledge on how to run a country. There's also an issue of distributive justice and who controls the world's resources. Most of the world's resources are consumed by developed nations. Most of the resources are sourced from developing nations. That includes the manufacturing and the resources that are used to produce low-cost products. Some of the world's comparative resource-rich um, countries have some of its poorest inhabitants. Okay. So that's objective two. Let's have a break now. There's a video that looks a little bit on those issues, about those issues which I will post. And then we're going to move on to objective three, understanding the operations of multinational corporations and the moral criticisms against them.